You're listening to episode 110 of My Life Radio. I am Matt Blackburn, and today I'm excited to interview Xander Holt, the primal sex expert. He has a great YouTube channel and a program called Rock Hard for Life. He mostly focuses on men's health with sexuality, but we also touch on women's health a little bit in the episode, and some things kind of carry over. And if you're in a relationship with someone, then it affects both of you. So this could help anyone that's in a relationship and that's struggling in this area. That's really the main focus of this episode because it's one of those things that a lot of people aren't taught growing up. I think Xander was one of those. I was one of those. And we just learn by trial and error and it's not very fun. There's a lot of failing and people can even get hurt in the process just because of a lack of information. And when there's a lack of information, there tends to be a lot of fear. So hopefully this clears up a lot of things about sex and how to make that whole process work and little tips that Xander's discovered over the years I think this is a subject that is not talked about enough. We need to have open discussions about this part of being a human being. So let's just jump right in. Here is Xander Holt. I'm here with Xander Holt. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Matt. Glad to be here. Yeah, I'm really happy that I found your videos on YouTube. I don't even remember the first one I saw, but for years I've been going down YouTube rabbit holes. That's kind of how I got into health over a decade ago. And you just have an awesome channel. Have you been making videos, it looks like, for about a year? Yeah, that's right. Just uh, almost exactly a year. I started last January, t- January 2020, I started. And yeah, it's been taken off pretty well. Yeah, I feel like there's not enough information like this being shared. Like sex is a very taboo subject. There's a lot of guilt and shame around it. And and even if there's not, I mean, tons of couples, like questions uh, that were sent in for this interview so many couples are having issues and it's affecting the relationship. Well, I can certainly relate to that. That's um, part of what led me down this path to begin with as I was having my own problems with uh, erectile dysfunction and and premature ejaculation. Wow. So can you kind of expand on that and how you got into this whole thing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, It was back in uh, 2013, I really started to notice difference. So that was, um, I was in my mid-40s, I'm 52 now. And uh, my wife at the time, uh, we had a retail store and we were just losing money hand over fist. And I was so much stress, we were just losing sleep and and, uh, and just chronically stressed and I was taking care of myself. I'm a physical therapist, and even though I was going to the gym, I was eating right, and I knew the stress probably had something to do with it, but even when the we started turning the business around, I still noticed a problem, and it was, um, I just, I wanted to figure out what was causing this problem, because I didn't want to take ED drugs. I almost did. I came really close to doing that, but actually... This was the main thing that caused me to go down this path is I had a friend of mine right at that point come and visit me because I had just moved to Colorado. And uh, as we were talking, he started to open up to me and he started talking about erectile problems he was having. And that was seven years in. So he was 47 then and he told me he didn't, he hadn't had a natural erection since he was 40 years old. So seven years he had been dealing with that. Yeah. And he took ED drugs and they worked for him, kind of worked for him for about a year and they stopped working altogether. So he went to his doctor looking for another solution and 
they gave him these crazy, I mean, first of all, they, they told him about surgery, like implanting a pump, cutting him open, cutting his penis open, putting a pump in there. And he heard that. It just, you know, started freaking out. I was listening to the story and I was freaking out. And then since he wasn't going to go for that, they, they told him about Trimix. Now, Trimix is a, a very powerful set of chemicals that you can inject into your penis. So I don't know if this was the doctor's strategy or, or not. You know, first give him the worst case scenario and then tell him about the injection. <laughs> but he, he went ahead and took him up on the injection. And they worked for him. He got really excited, although it was a real pain because he's single. And um, the way these things work is you have to keep them refrigerated. So he didn't want to let the women know about it. So he had to get them to his place. Then he had to sneak off to the bathroom and inject himself. And um, then he had to come up with some sort of excuse why his erection wouldn't go down after he ejaculates. So it was a big mess for him. But what really scared me is one of these times he did it, he said his erection just wouldn't go down. And it went on for almost 12 hours. And it really freaked him out. Yeah. So he went to the emergency room, was too scared to go in because he read about what they do. What they do is they drain the blood. And if that doesn't work, if there's actual necrosis in the penis, so if the penis tissue has died, they will amputate it. So, yeah. So, yeah, that's exactly how I felt. So he just freaked out. He went home. He got on the Internet. And he found a guy who did this to himself. He got rid of the erection. So he read that post. He downloaded a picture of the penis to get the exact anatomy to where he needed to stab himself because what he needed to do is take that same hypodermic needle he injected himself with to take the blood out. So he stabbed himself. He pulled the plunger out, and the blood that came out of him was thick and black just like used motor oil. And yeah, when he took, because they had no more oxygen, because that's what happens when that blood gets trapped in there. It can't get any more oxygen. So that's why your penis will die. Uh, luckily, that didn't happen to him. And he, he did okay after that. But after hearing that story, I never even got the ED drugs. At that point, I just, I've, I've figured, I've got to figure this out for myself. I'm a physical therapist. I'm into nutrition. I've, there's got to be a way to do this. And uh, that set me down this whole path. It took me about five years to really kind of condense it all together. But I figured it out. And then I started teaching other guys how to do it. That, that made me cringe, that story. Is it, <laughs> was, yeah, was it like an too. insulin needle? Me I too. can't even imagine. <laughs> Was it like a diabetic you know, I, kind of syringe? Yeah, it's a good question. It's a good question. <laughs> I haven't actually seen what a Trimix needle looks like. That's a good question. I'm assuming it's just like a standard hypodermic needle. But that's what you do. Every time you need, you want an erection, you have to inject yourself directly into your penis with this mix. Jeez. Yeah, I've heard because yeah. I've been in like the biohacking world, and I've heard that people will inject like stem cells in their penis. And there's probably... Probably healthier things, but that still freaks me out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anything, any kind of injection, right? But yeah, that's different. That's like a pee shot. So um, that is a, an attempt to help your body rejuvenate the nerves and tissues in there to help to get a better re- erection. Uh, this is more of, um, it's almost like ED drugs, but just being directly injected into your penis. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Did he try like Viagra or Cialis or any, anything like that? Yeah, that's what he had first. So those, like I said, those work for kind of, even he said even those didn't work great all the time. Um, in fact, uh, what he told me is that sometimes they give him a good erection, sometimes they give him a semi-erection to where he could at least penetrate. But the side effects they gave him were more than what he wanted to deal with. He would say he'd wake up in the middle of the night with bile in his nose, stomach acid boiling up, and like his nose on fire is how he described it because it was so intense. And actually what led that to that him going back to that doctor is that one time those ED drugs didn't work, and the woman he was with actually got up, 
when he lost his erection, got up, got dressed, stomped out of the room, and yelled at him, it's not me, it's you. And, uh, and then he was, it just emotionally devastated him. Yeah, I find, I think that happens to a lot of, uh, well, both men and women, but, but men, uh, from what I've heard, it can just scar them for years and years and really affect their performance. We have a bunch of like psychological, philosophical questions that people put in, but like the trauma and like the, just the performance anxiety thing is, is really real for but I think it's kind of a combination probably of nutritional deficiencies and toxicity, right? It's kind of everything. It, it really is. You know, in trauma, sexual trauma, sexual shame, performance anxiety, those things are huge. But you're right. It's, it's a huge um, factor. That's what I learned over those years of research is that it's not just one thing. And that's part of the reason why I couldn't put my finger on it is that, you know, I was already eating well. I was already exercising. You know, it's like all the things you think that would be good – my testosterone levels were fine, you know, but what I started to find is that there's all what I call alpha inhibitors, modern day alpha inhibitors that actually attack your manhood, stuff that our grandfathers never had to deal with, like high speed internet porn, EM, EMFs, um, you know, preservatives and foods, all these different things that are out there that affect us as men um, that, like I said, our fathers and grandfathers never had to deal with, at least not at this kind of level. And when you combine all that stuff together, it becomes very difficult to determine what exactly is um, causing it. So that's part of what I've done with my system is help guys determine, okay, this is my prime, what I call primary core alpha inhibitor. If I focus on this, then I'm more than likely going to make the most amount of progress because there's so many different things that can be affecting it. You know, hormones, blood flow, all kinds of things, performance, anxiety. That's awesome. Yeah. A guy yeah. that I, uh, return guest have on the show, Adam Bergstrom, really interesting character, like around 80 years old, but just encyclopedia. He writes like sex newsletters and stuff. And, um, yeah, he was, uh, where was they going? Oh, it, oh yeah. He was like, Instead of asking, how do I boost testosterone? The question should actually be, um, how do I remove like the things that are lowering it? Like instead of everyone's just all about boosting it, right? <laughs> yes. Yes. That's, that's very wise. That's exactly right. That's why I call them, uh, modern day alpha inhibitors, right? Because if those inhibitors weren't there, things would be working good. It's that it's when things are working naturally in the way they're supposed to, Everything's good. It's things that are blocking it that are the problem. Mm -hmm. Very wise. Interesting. Yeah, I, I mess with a lot of weird technologies, and I started uh, using this because I'm really into water. And I started using yeah. this like infopathy thing, which like pretty much you can put frequencies into the water, and supposedly by drinking it, you get a similar energetic match. So it sounds super woo woo, but I've been putting like the frequency of five alpha reductase inhibitors into my water <laughs> drinking it. So wow. we'll see Is what that, that does. Right. <laughs> that's awesome. We, we've got to talk about that after the podcast because that, that sounds really interesting. I'm big into water too and how important it is and all the stuff they've learned recently, like the fourth state of water and the fact that it can move on its own if it's got a hydrophilic surface. Yeah, fascinating stuff. Yeah, yeah. That's why I love red light because that's part of the effect it has on us, like creating that. But uh, I think we had a question about that. But uh, yeah, so was what kind of uh, what were some big like milestones in your journey, like of discoveries, like the five, the alpha reductase inhibitors. Um, any anything else? Like, you, did you kind of switch up your nutrition at all, or was it other stuff that you did? Yeah, th that's part of what it is. You know, I um, got definitely more um, knowledgeable and implemented stuff more on the gut. Um, in specific types of um, fascial release to um, get rid of any kind of impingement on blood flow that, you know, feeds the penis. Um, different things like that. There's all kinds of stuff I went down, but... One of the, I would say one of the biggest breakthroughs in, you know, I call myself the primal ex sex expert. And the reason I call myself the primal sex expert is because 
for me, a lot, what, what I found out what was happening, it's not just all this um, physical stuff. Like we talked here about um, performance anxiety, sexual shame, sexual guilt. You know, I was raised Catholic and I was, um, I, I had a lot of sexual guilt, right? And more so than I even realized. And, you know, I was married. We went through um, marital counseling for about a year. And I knew I had these sexual repression problems. So I tried to work it out when we were in that, um, going through that year's worth of therapy because I knew that was part of my problem. And um, after the year, I don't feel like I made any progress in terms of the sexual guilt. Uh, and, and they didn't work for the marriage either. I mean, we ended up getting divorced. And I don't want to say anything, you know, I mean, therapy can certainly be good, but it didn't help me with that. So I got this wild idea because I started getting back into the dating market, right? And I was concerned because my erections still weren't where I wanted them to. I still was worried about premature ejaculation. And I said, if I could just get at this sexual repression, if I could find some way to get to it. And I got this crazy idea of, you know, animals having sex. I say, well, animals don't, they weren't raised Catholic. You know, they weren't, they didn't have all this stuff put on them. I'm going to, I'm going to study them for a little bit. So I actually got on YouTube and started looking at animals having sex and, you know, reading about animal sex and trying to see what was different about what they were doing. And, you know, one of which is it tends to be pretty rough and expressive, but definitely very vocal. And that was one thing that really hit me because I, I really got to realize that, you know, I'm so silent when it comes to sex, I'm just not making noise. It's like, that's like a part of the root of my repression. So I started working on being like an animal first, just by myself, just making noises, rolling around, trying to get out of my head, totally into my body, trying to be as animalistic as I can. And the first time after I started doing that, the first time I went into a sexual encounter, it's not that like I started acting like an animal, but I had that energy, that kind of freedom, and I was expressing myself vocally. It was the best sexual experience I had ever had, and she said she had ever had. Um, in that, and it was, and it came down to that primal self-expression. So I'm I'm big on that, and not only in having great sex, but it helps with your erections, your performance anxiety, being able to express yourself without that inhibition. Wow. Yeah, that makes sense. And we're, I feel like we're raised in a society, like I, I just think back in school, like to speak, you have to raise your hand and wait to talk. Like we're like trained to like not be able to express ourselves. Like immediately. It's true. Know. It's true. <laughs> and it's not that there's not a place for that. There's certainly a place for that, right? But the bedroom is not the place for that, right? The bedroom is the perfect opportunity to let the animal out, to let the what you truly want and um, express that and, and feed and um, tune into your partner and see how they're um, responding to all that. And then it becomes so much more of a powerful experience uh, when you're both just enjoying the moment and being yourselves and expressing yourselves fully uh, than it is being in your head and, you know, or repressing yourself by being silent. I think that's a particularly um, uh, notorious issue with men. Yeah. But funny story, actually, my first uh, apartment ever by myself it was like a small apartment complex in Pacific Beach, SoCal. And there was this couple that at least three times a week, they would have really loud sex that went for like, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes. I'm sure the entire complex could hear them. And so it's probably easier if you're on a homestead or you're a little further and not in an apartment complex because the entire place could, <laughs> could hear you. That's true. That's true. You know, and it, it kind of depends on what... Uh what you want to deal with because um, if you're going to be stuck in that situation, if it were me, I'd probably go ahead and do it anyway. You know, <laughs> I've gotten to this point where I just don't care as much anymore. It's like, you know, life is short. I'm, you know, I'm going to really enjoy this, but I can understand that if you're in a situation where that's, you know, 
people are going to be hearing you, particularly if that bothers you, it's going to repress you. Maybe you should consider moving. (laughs) (laughs) Or do it at a different time of day. I don't know. Right. (laughs) Yeah, I can totally relate with the the guilt thing. It's my understanding like guilt is a personal feeling and shame is like a societal, communal kind of like judgment. Uh, Mm -hmm. I found uh, this Dr. Daryl Ray, he started this organization called uh, Recovering from Religion. He's like staunch atheist, which I don't really agree with, but I agree with him on a lot. And he has a great uh, video series um, where he talks about the the sexual guilt cycle. And he says, like, basically religion implants the guilt seed in you. And then you're going to have these thoughts and you're going to act on them. And then you're going to go back to the religion. It's just around and round she goes and just over and over. It's just this cycle. I thought that was a really great way of describing it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'd like to see that. Um, yeah. I mean, there's no doubt that um, religion plays a big part when it comes to sexual guilt and sexual shame. Yeah. It's a, it's a big part of it. And, but I, I, f- I feel like you can still be, religious and, and and get over that you know uh, and part of that can be like what I'm talking about if you just express yourself if you just let it out um, it's once once again you're getting rid of the inhibitor right as long as you get rid of the inhibitor what is natural is going to flow through I think that's really cool though that you started uh, watching animals because I feel like <laughs> like I used to be vegan raw vegan vegetarian I just tried all the different ways and variations I could to get muscle meat out of my life. Cause it was just, it felt too like gross or whatever, like base or something. But at one point I just realized yeah. like we're part animal. Like we need, like we don't judge other animals for eating animals. Right. <laughs> True. <So. laughs> That's right. And uh, yeah, my, yeah, my experience I that, was like, I think we're probably, oh, sorry. Sorry, go ahead. There's a delay. <laughs> no, no, no. I was just going to say that I, I think that we probably are omnivores. I mean, we do seem to be more omnivore. And, th- and that's my approach. I've done both as well. I've gone, you know, vegan and I've gone more toward the carnivore diet. And I, I, you know, I don't like limiting myself like that. I don't think you really need to. I think plants and animals are, are good for us. It's more the quality of food. How good is the food? And that will help determine how good it's going to serve us. Yeah, I completely agree. That's awesome that you have that that balanced approach. Uh, a lot of people are missing that. They go to <laughs> either extreme. And yeah. Uh, yeah, my experience that I've heard from a lot of guys, like just adding back in bison or elk or deer or beef just supercharges their performance and libido. And that was kind of my experience. Like I was, I completely lost my libido. And then when I added back in animal products, it's like, Oh wow, I'm a human being again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it can certainly. I, I've I've heard that story a lot from guys too, um, especially vegans, going back to eating uh, meat. But I have vegans too that uh, go through my course. You you don't have to be, at least for what I teach. It, there's no particular diet that won't particularly work. I'm not a fan of diets, either any kind of extreme. I'm really not. To me. Diets are a reaction to, once again, these modern alpha inhibitors, the fact that we can get all these processed foods, right? We, in any time of day that we can, we want them. Um, and it creates us to put on this weight. So we come up with a system to help take the weight off called dieting. But if we just were living more natural and primal and just eating good foods and I, I'm a big fan of certain forms of fasting. So I think the body is designed and is meant to give the gut a break. If you're doing that kind of stuff, if you're just eating good quality foods and you're giving your gut a break and you're drinking high quality water, you know, I I really don't see the need for most people to diet. And you said something earlier that I wanted to circle back to with your, your business. And do you think there's a connection with, finances and uh, libido and sexuality. Cause I feel like there is right. Like when someone's making more money, they tend to be more confident kind of in all areas, I guess. <laughs> yes, absolutely. 
In fact, they've done, uh, they've looked at studies on this where the top earning entrepreneurs also have the highest libidos. So, and I think it's circular. I mean, they, they feed off of each other, right? Having a higher libido gives you more energy, makes you more ambitious, and makes you more wanting to go after what you really want. And vice versa, doing that type of stuff, just, you know, getting rid of the stuff that's holding you back and going for what you want tends to boost your libido. So, yeah, I think there's a, a, a direct correlation between a high libido and, um, you know, being highly successful, particularly financially successful. That makes, that makes sense. Um, well, I guess we should jump into the questions. We have quite a few to get through. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. <laughs> awesome. I'll do my best. <laughs> um, this is a funny, a funny one to start with. What do men really like from a woman? Ah, what do men really like from a woman? I wonder if this is asked by a woman. Do you know? <laughs> the um, that's a good question. You know, um, you know, I someone because someone asked me this question or similar question uh, not too long ago, and the thing is, okay, because <laughs> I'm pre, I'm because I, I I might upset some people with my answer. But that's okay. But because I think men are a lot simpler than women in this sense. Is it's not that I think this is all that men went want from women. But I think if a woman wants a man to stick around and just be there, there's really two basic things, and that's just to be nice, just to be a nice person, and to have frequent sex. You know, particularly when the guy wants to have sex. If those two things are covered, you're probably not going anywhere. Okay. Um, not that that's not all they want, but if I'm reading into that question, you know, you know, if you want to get down, if you want to get it down to the very basics, you know, guys just want a happy, easygoing time, and they want sex. So if those things are provided they probably aren't going anywhere. Where with point. women, it's more complicated. You know, they want emotional connection. I mean, guys want that too, but it's not like they need it as much. You know, there's other things that women need that I think that guys don't need as much. It's just simpler, you know. That makes sense, yeah. Uh, have you heard too, I don't know, it's a question for me, that men are more stimulated visually and women are more stimulated like auditorily or other ways there's no doubt about so, it there's no doubt about it that's for sure i mean you could see that with um porn for instance right the vast majority of porn consumption is by men you know there's women too don't get me wrong but most of it's by men and then most of the literary porn like romance novels are are by women you know, uh, read by women. And it's even more, I think the, I think there's more, there's more book sales of romance novels, I think, than in all other categories combined. I believe that's true. So, but that's like women's porn, right? But that's much more auditory and getting into the imagination. And with, with men, it's much more visual. But I try to teach men to be less visual, because it helps them get more into the moment, more into the um, enjoying the moment rather than just relying on your sight. That makes sense. Yeah. I think years ago, I, yeah, I think it was the girl I was dating. I went to like an RV park of, uh, yeah, it was her dad. And he had a porn like up on like his, he had like a projector with his computer connected. And I was just like, it started to, turn the wheels in my head. Like, I don't want to turn into this. And so <laughs> I, <laughs> I eventually quit and, uh, haven't looked back since. And it's, my brain feels better. I feel like I perceive women better. There's more of a connection. I function better. Uh, there, I, have you heard of the website called your brain on porn? Yeah, like absolutely. It's one of the first, um, one of the first w uh, websites I found that really went in deep on what happens in your brain when you're watching porn. 
um, you know, now it's kind of morphed into NoFap. And, but it, uh, yeah, that was a really great um, website that came out on that. And that taught me a lot. And guys really didn't understand that because when that f- first came out, I mean, I, for years I fought that. I was addicted to porn, big time, for year, decades, okay, lots of porn. And the, the whole concept in my head about being addicted to porn, it was like, that's crazy. Or it causing any kind of problem. It's like it's just images on the screen, you know. How is that going to cause me any problem? But it causes a lot of problems. Uh, it, it's one of the core modern-day alpha inhibitors I consider to be uh, internet porn, in particular, modern-day high-speed internet porn. You know, that's one of the things, like I said, it's one of the things our grandfathers never had to deal with. You know, they had Playboy and Penthouse and that kind of stuff, which is fine. That does not produce the same kind of effect that porn does, particularly high-speed internet porn, because it just floods your brain with dopamine, which hammers those dopamine receptors and makes them let much less sensitive. So when you get in a situation where you're with a real woman, you know, then they can't even help to, they can't compete. They can't produce that amount of dopamine that your brain now needs to get that erection. So yeah, porn is a, is a big one. And I, I highly recommend, I'm not anti-porn. In fact, sometimes I'll watch porn. Like if a woman comes over and she wants to watch porn, I'll watch porn with her. It's not a big deal. I'm with her. And actually that can, in that sense, it can give you some good clues because you can see what's turning her on right? You can see what specific things she's into. So you can use porn to your advantage in that sense. But if you're addicted to porn, if you're watching porn every day uh, and constantly masturbating to porn, it is going to affect your erections. It's going to affect your libido. It's going to affect your elastic power. Make no doubt about it. That's awesome. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, I I have an article pulled up here from the BBC that says sex robots may cause psychological damage from Mm. uh, February of last year. And I didn't know, like, I guess there's a U.S. company, Harmony Robot, sells between eight and ten grand. Have you heard about the whole sex robot thing? Because I feel like that's the next level of porn. Like, that's porn 2.0. And I feel yeah. like it's <laughs> going to be pretty crazy. That's a good way to put it because it is like an outshoot of porn if you think about it. It's like taking the whole human element out of it now where it's all about the mechanics. You know, it's all about the mechanics of sex. And I think what we'll find, because a lot of guys who get addicted to porn also get depressed. And I think you're going to see that even more when you've got robots. And it's like, all of a sudden you got this empty feeling in you all the time, right? Because it's not a person. It's not a real person. You're not connecting on any kind of level. It's just a release. And not that there's anything wrong with that release. Don't get me wrong. But if you think a robot is going to satisfy you on any kind of long-term basis, it's just there's just no way. It's just not going to do it. There's yeah. no soul there. There's no person there. You see a... I like the futuristic movies like Blade Runner 2049. He's like dating a, like a hologram girl. <laughs> no, but I'm glad you brought that up. Cause I've been, I've wanted to watch that movie. I forgot all about it. <laughs> of course I've seen Blade Runner several times, but I haven't seen the updated version. It's pretty good. I, I guess since I'm a young and I haven't seen the first one, so I have to go back and watch that. <laughs> oh, it's great. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, awesome. Uh, let's see. Is red light therapy on the genitals a good idea? <laughs> <laughs> I would say yes. I use red light therapy. But what I would say with that is um, you – okay, so there's different frequencies of, uh, of red light. And typically what they found, if I remember correctly, it's in the 600 range and the 800 range that tends to help the most. I don't think there's much happening in the 700 range. But if you buy these lights, you can buy them at these various frequencies, and some of them will have both the 600 and the 800. I think it's 660 nanometers and 850 nanometers, I think. And the 850 is what they call near-infrared. So if you have that on your, on your light, it will penetrate deeper. 
if you use that kind of light, don't go any closer than six inches to your testicles. All right, I'm going to say that one more time. Don't go any closer than six inches to your testicles because it doesn't seem, I say this kind of stuff all the time, and then guys want to say, well, if the six inches is good, three inches could be even better. Two, I'm going to get it real deep. No. <laughs> okay, you could potentially cause damage. Potentially, I don't know, but you think about food, you know, being heated up by these lights, you know, you don't want that with your testicles. And if it's far enough away, you shouldn't really be feeling heat. Now, if it's a 660 only, you can get that closer because it doesn't go as deep. But that's what I would say is that, yes, it's been shown to, because what happens is that red light, and the same thing with sunlight. Sunlight will do the same thing. you got to be careful and don't want to overdo it. it once again, a, a treatment session shouldn't go over 20 minutes once a day, okay, a maximum, okay, to, just to keep everything safe because it is your testicles we're talking about. So the light goes in to the testicles into what's called the Leydig cells, which activates the mitochondria in there, which helps produce testosterone. So it will help you naturally produce testosterone. And I think it's really good to use that or sunlight uh, because if you think about it, how often do, you know, does your scrotum see the light of day? You know, not too much. And light is, I think, highly, highly underrated in what it can do for you. I mean, even if you think about food and nutrition, it's all eventually, it's coming from light eventually going into photosynthesis, creating all kind of nutrition, which the animal's eating if you're going to eat the animal. But, but it initially comes from light and water, right? So Light can be really powerful. Just do it, just like anything I recommend, do it correctly. Okay, more is not better. But yes, I think red light therapy is an excellent modality. That was awesome. Uh, have you looked into vagal tone? I've had a few guests on talking about like the, the different branches of the nervous system and the vagus nerve and all these things. Have you looked at the connection between like can regular orgasms help? with vagal tone? You know, that I don't know, but I do do a lot of work with the vagus nerve. Very important in, in my work. I do a lot of stuff with the vagus nerve, but I don't know if having an orgasm will improve the tone. I do know that the vagus nerve, when it comes down, it, it, it forms, it, it, um, it come, it makes a junction with a nerve plexus that feeds the genitals. So they're, it, they're connected in that sense. It doesn't directly go to the genitals, but it connects to a, a plexus of nerve that goes to the genitals. So it's possible. It's possible. I don't know. But I would say that doing work with the vagus nerve will definitely help you because it puts you into a relaxed state, into the parasympathetic nervous system, which is going to help a lot with your erections and your lasting power and just enjoying sex much more. That's awesome. Uh, natural lube recommendations, non-toxic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Well, um, I don't have any here to show you, but I would say, first of all, I would say organic coconut oil. Okay, that's what I use the vast majority of the time. It's good for you. It's good for your skin. Um, and uh, it's great because assuming it's not too hot in your house, it stays almost like Vaseline. You know, you can just scoop it right out of there. I always have some by my bed. Um, the If you're going to use a water-based lube, then I recommend, uh, there's one called uh, Sliquid H2O, which is the one that I, th I find that has the least amount of offensive chemicals in it. But I don't tend to use water-based lube unless there's some sort of toy involved. Other than that, because you don't want to use oil on a toy because it can break the toy down. But other than that, I just I recommend coconut oil. You can also use olive oil. You can use grapeseed oil, almond oil. Any of those will work. Okay, awesome. Uh, someone asked, swallowing semen, any nutritional benefits? <laughs> <I know laughs> there's, there's, lots, there's lots of nutritional benefits <laughs> to semen, um, as well as female ejaculate. Um, but the... In addition to the nutrients, okay, it's a highly nutritive 
I mean, because it's, it's supporting life itself, right? Or human life, at least part of human life. So it's full of nutrition. But even more than that, it has life in it. It's, it's life-giving, right? It's because of the sperm in, in the semen. So, yeah, I consider it a, a highly powerful uh, fluid um, in addition to, like I said, female ejaculatory fluid. You know, I, if I, if a woman is a squirting, you know, squirting orgasms, I will actually drink that fluid because I feel like it gives me magical powers. People laugh at me for that, but I, I really do. I feel like I take in that life energy, that female life energy, and it kind of balances me out. Yeah, there's uh, spermidine and sp spermine, I think, are interesting, but yeah, it has nerve growth factor oxytocin progesterone endorphins <laughs> it's like yeah all kinds of great stuff. Of stuff zinc <laughs> protein yeah there's there's great stuff in semen for sure yeah um let's see is there such a thing as too much sex for a person with a healthy foundation <laughs> well you know it's a good question I, I think it's different for every person i i would assume there's there's too there can be too much of anything so it all depends you know um I would say it's it's really up to the person. Every person has a different libido. Where I wouldn't say I, I would say most people probably wouldn't go beyond that unless you're causing yourself some sort of physical damage, which shouldn't be happening if you're doing things correctly, like unless you're doing rough, you know, really rough sex with no kind of lubrication or rough masturbation or that kind of stuff. There's probably not an issue where, what, what comes to be an issue when you're saying too much sex is like if you're in a, a monogamous relationship and one person wants more sex than the other person, that's where it tends to be a problem. But I wouldn't say there's a, you know, for some people, maybe several times a day they want to have a sex. And for other people, it may be just several times a month. I mean, you know, or whatever. Well, let's dive into that because we did have quite a few questions uh about libido and you know my husband has a low sex drive uh what to do with the mis mismatched libido or uh the flip side i can't keep up with my partner he wants it all the time is there something wrong with me <laughs> so both ends <laughs> right. of the spectrum there <laughs> right right well you know when it comes to libido okay now we're opening up a more complicated topic but a very important one because uh, there's um there's several angles that you should approach this from one of which is if you are in a, a relationship like that, you guys need to start talking about it. You, see, you need to be open about how you're feeling in, in a non-judgmental way. You know, you sit down and say, you know, I, I'm not complaining or, you know, I, you know, I don't want this to be taken the wrong way. But, you know, I, I feel like we really need to discuss this because it could it could turn into a big problem, especially over time, is that, you know, either – Either you're having the higher sex drive or they're having the higher sex drive. But to talk about it, first of all, and um, try to get on the same page and not judge each other, you know. The other is, and, then when, and during that conversation, see if you can get into, and you can even make a game out of this, diving deep into talking about what your sexual desires really are your true sexual desires. And actually it's a really good idea to do that individually before you even start talking about it together. Like in, in my course, Rock Hard for Life Formula, that's step number one is I have guys go through what I call the true, your true sexual desires worksheet to find out because of that sexual repression. What might be going in your mind is it if you dive deeply, you may find that there's things that really turn you on, that you're afraid to talk to your partner about, you're afraid to admit to yourself about. Some things that may be going through your mind might have just been implanted there, like maybe something that you've just been seeing over and over in porn, but it's not something that really typically, like you're really into. Um, you know, really getting deep, that's really important because when you're talking about libido, you're talking about wakening up that desire and you have to know what you desire you have to know what that is in order to waken it up so 
knowing what that is is really important. It's really it's it's worth your time to sit down if you want to do this as a couple or individually. I recommend doing it individually first and then getting together as a couple and talking about it. But going into a space where you're completely non-judgmental, and that's very important, um, especially I mean from either side, because if you're going to judge the other person you might as well not have the conversation because you're going to make things a whole lot worse. Okay. She's not going to open up to you anymore or is going to be very reluctant to do that if you're judgmental. And if you're judgmental toward him, he may have even more of a difficult time having an erection if he's already not getting them because you're going to super amplify that performance anxiety. He's going to feel a lot of, he's going to be in his head. So non-judgment is really important if you're going to do this. But I do recommend you do it if you're gonna if you're serious about being in a long-term relationship with this person and having a great sex life. Getting at the root of what you guys really desire deep down is really important. So that's sort of the fundamental things. Um, and then I would say, from a physical perspective, make sure your gut is doing really well. Okay, take really good care of your gut because. You're, well, there's, there's a multiple reasons for this, but to, to make it simple, 60% of your immune system's in the gut. And if you are, say you have leaky gut, for instance, your gut's not in good shape. And what leaky gut means is that some of the stuff in your gut, like food particles or bad bacteria, instead of staying in the gut, it leaks out into the blood system. And once it gets in the blood system, your immune system has to deal with it. And when it comes to libido and sexual performance, your body does one of two things. It either jacks up your immune system to take care of, let's put it this way. If your immune system has to take care of something, your libido and your sexual performance is second place. Okay. But the good news is, is it's right beneath it. So because your body has to keep you alive first. Right? So it's got to keep you alive, so your immune system has to kick in. But once it keeps you alive and you're healthy, its second priority is to propagate your genes. Right? So sex is next in line. But in order to access that, you have to make sure your gut is in good health. Okay? And you're just overall healthy in general. Hormonal balance, really important. But the gut has a lot to do with that and what you're putting in your body. So particularly for women, hormones really important, um, those getting thrown off. Uh, it's important for men too, but uh, let me talk about something on that too, because this might help the couples out there, is also how you, it's very important that you have effective skills to keep each other calm, to you can help soothe each other. Let's put it that way. Because neither of you are going to be in the mood if you are, you know, upset and angry with each other. But there's a very interesting difference between men and women when it comes to stress and when we're talking about cortisol levels. It's very important to bring cortisol down because when you're stressed, cortisol goes up in the body. And to bring cortisol down allows sex hormones to go up, okay? It's an inverse relationship. So that's another reason why it's important to take stress uh, cortisol down. But the difference is with men, cortisol is brought down by bringing up testosterone, okay? So that's why a lot of times men want to just get after something or they want to just come home and just relax and do nothing, to bring those testosterone levels up. Because as testosterone goes up, cortisol goes down. But for women, it's not that way. Testosterone doesn't do that. Testosterone is important for their sex drive, but the cortisol has to come down to bring the testosterone up, and the testosterone won't, come, won't do that. What does it for women is oxytocin. So women need to bond, you know, they need to, talk, they especially talk through things and bond with guys where they feel that connection. And when they feel that connection, then the cortisol comes down. And I bring this up because not only does it affect sex hormones, but it, it creates a lot of misunderstanding. 
right? Because sometimes guys, they get stressed and, you know, they just want to, they want to go after, they want to have sex, right? Because that's going to help them bring their stress level down. Where with women, that's not the case. You know, they need that, they need to feel connected first before that's going to happen. So if either, if both genders keep that in mind when they're trying to help each other, it can really help. You know, uh, to listen to your woman, really listen to her and let her talk and get what she needs to go through so that you can bring her stress levels down and then you can start working on, you know, amping up her arousal. And for women, the same thing. Just keep in mind for him, what he needs to do is boost that testosterone up. Wow, that's a really good point. Yeah, I've studied uh, endotoxin a lot and that's like a something that, bad bacteria secrete in the gut. And I like what you said about if the immune system's overactive on overdrive, then, you know, the secondary system to that, which is reproduction is going to be shut down. And, um, yeah, I looked up endotoxin initiated inflammation reduces testosterone. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a strong connection there with the libido. So yeah. That's and not I- only does it reduce testosterone, it does it quickly. It reduces it quickly. There's um there's a theory out there. It's one of the newest theories. It's called the gelding theory, and that's what it talks about. It talks about how endotoxins from the gut, getting into the bloodstream, dropping testosterone levels, which brings libido down. So keep in mind, testosterone is very important for women's libido too. So we're not, it's not just men. So if if a woman's libido comes down, I mean, sorry, testosterone comes down. Uh, her libido is going to come down too. Um, so I just want to make sure that's clear. That was awesome. Yeah, that was great info. Uh, let's see here. Uh, this is a good one on the same same path. What are the best foods and supplements to promote libido? Okay. Yeah, that's good. That's a good question. So um, first of all, anything that's going to help the gut. So let's start. I'm going, to st- I'm going to give you what I think are the most important. Um, where do I want to start there? Well, let's start like with the water. Okay, water is really important. So you want to make sure you're getting good quality, I call it mineralized water. So there's, there's, there's you know, minerals in your water so it gets absorbed. You've got good hydration. You're getting, I, say, I recommend at least two quarts a day of that. Um, because if you're not getting that, once again, those endotoxins are going to build up your body has to flush all that stuff out, right? So water is always number one. You got to make sure you get good water. And with that too, sleep, uh, although that's not part of a supplement, but sleep is super important when it comes to your libido. Good quality sleep, eight hours of sleep, okay? Um, Because that's where actually most of your hormones are produced when you sleep, including testosterone. So if you're not getting that, you're not getting those hormones and those, when you're talking about libido, at least from a physical perspective, you're talking primarily about hormones and them being balanced properly. So that's really important. Um, And then just uh, quickly in terms of the gut, making sure you get good prebiotics and probiotics. So with probiotics that can be supplements, you could take supplements, but I prefer live foods, uh, particularly like kimchi or sauerkraut really good for the gut just make sure they're in the refrigerated section if you get them because that's what if you get them off the shelf the probiotics have been cooked out that's what gives them shelf life so you you need to get the refrigerated ones and then when i say a prebiotic prebiotic that's what the probiotics eat so um simple things like apples bananas um, I think asparagus, uh, artichoke. There's a lot of different things that are prebiotics, cacao, um, that feed that. So that will really help keep a healthy gut. It then in terms of supplements or nutrition, there's lots of things that are important, but the most important things are vitamin D3 or vitamin D because, all of your hormones are dependent upon vitamin D. It's not even really a vitamin. It's a, it's a hormone precursor. So you got to have that. The only thing I would say is when you take it, I would take it with K2. So when I take it, I take it in drops. A uh, Thorn brand or Athletic Greens makes one um, where it will have 
D3 with K2 in it. And the reason that's important is because one of the things that D3 does is it tells the body to absorb calcium. But it doesn't tell the body where to absorb that calcium. And that can cause problems because it can get absorbed into your blood vessels causing hard plaque, which will affect your erections, and, uh, among other problems that it gives. So what the K2 does is while D3 says, okay, absorb the calcium, the K2 tells it where to go. Okay, absorb the calcium into the bone. So that's why it's important to take those two together. And I would recommend if you're going to take that, take it in either a liquid form or a gel form because they found that the powder form does not absorb nearly as well. So that's one. The the way that they, there's a there's wide variety and people and how much they say to take, anywhere from 1,000 mil, uh, is, it, is that right? 1,000 international units to 5,000, even 10,000. I personally take 3,500 international units, and the only reason I take that amount is because they, they've shown that free testosterone increases at somewhere around 3,000 to 3,500 international units. Um, and I don't take more than that because you also need magnesium. Okay, and magnesium, I would say, this is probably the second most important. And in order for that D to become active in your body, it has to use magnesium. And there's only so much magnesium you can absorb without starting to have, like, laxative problems and stuff. So... I, I tone it down a little bit on the D3K2. I take 3,500 international units, and then I take somewhere between three to 600 milligrams of magnesium. And I also eat a lot of magnesium-rich foods. But that's really important, D3K2, magnesium, and zinc. Now, with zinc, I don't personally take a supplement uh, because you can overdo it with zinc. Um, I, if you do take a supplement, I wouldn't go anything anywhere over 50. In fact, I'd keep it probably closer to 30 milligrams. But if you're eating high zinc foods, particularly animal products, they have a lot of zinc in it, you probably don't even need to, uh, to supplement that. That was awesome. Yeah, you, you'd like my interview with, um, cause I've had a lot of episodes on minerals. That's kind of a fascination of mine, like the interconnectedness between vitamins, minerals, and enzymes, and like that triangle that's formed. And uh, I interviewed two really smart guys, Morley Robbins and Jim Stevenson Jr. that actually has like a Facebook uh, group called Secosteroid Hormone D. He's been like kicked off Facebook and off of other groups because uh, he doesn't really troll, but he'll, he's kind of anti-supplementing vitamin D and you're, it sounds like you're really knowledgeable about the active and the, there's the storage in an active form. And that conversion process is catalyzed by magnesium, which is awesome. Most people don't know that. Um, just to be safe, I, I use the ultraviolet light. But what the most interesting thing I got from that discussion is that they actually raised the bar from 21 nanograms per milliliter to what the normal range they say now is like 40 to 100 or something or 40 to 80, whereas normal used to be 21. And this was like, I think in the 80s. So... Um, it's interesting. The reference ranges have shifted for a lot of nu nutrients. And I just question like the money that's behind those shifts. Mm. Uh, cause actually the guy that raised it sold vitamin D supplements. <laughs> that's uh, a fact. It, it could be, <laughs> it could be. And yeah, that's a good point that you brought up. Well, first of all, I should have said from the beginning, I'm not a doctor. Okay. I'm a physical therapist. <laughs> so, you know, don't take this as medical advice or any substitute for medical advice. You know, I do a lot of research on this stuff like yourself, Right, we're super interested in this stuff, so we're constantly reading about it and learning. Uh, but do your own research, you know, um, like just like we have. Um, but the sun, of course, you get vitamin D. It's just that as you get older, you don't tend to. It's not as efficient, right? The vitamin D. Uh, so I take it just as a precaution, just to make sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's awesome that you dug into it, though. A lot of people just take it and don't know about the K or the magnesium, so you're. You're ahead of the curve there. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I, I'm a big nerd when it comes to this stuff. <laughs> um, so there, we had a couple people ask about high sex drive and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, some, 
question made me laugh. Should a 30 year old male be as horny as a teenager? <laughs> Sounds like a good problem. <laughs> well, if you are, you're doing good. You're doing good. Um, it's kind of funny you say that though, because you know, the first guy, when I first started doing this a few years ago, first started actually being the primal sex expert. I mean, I come from physical therapy and I moved into this. The very first guy who contacted me was 17. Okay, with erectile dysfunction and a low libido. And since that time, I've gotten lots of guys under 20 with low libidos and erectile dysfunction. More, And it's more so than it's ever been in history. And once again, it comes down to these modern-day alpha inhibitors. And I think one of the primary ones is high-speed internet porn, especially for young guys, okay, having those kind of issues. So I just bring that up because when you're comparing yourself to a teenager... The teenagers of today aren't like the teenagers of 20 years ago or 40 years ago or 60 years, unfortunately, because of all the stuff we got to deal with. Um, but, you know, having a high sex drive is optimal, is optimal. You want that. Like we just talked about earlier about entrepreneurs, the most successful entrepreneurs are the ones that had the highest sex drive. They looked at the things they had in common, and that's one of the things they all had in common was this really high sex drive. So you... One thing to keep in mind with that is that you don't necessarily have to use all of that sexual energy for sex, right? You can use that to go after whatever it is you want in life and make that happen. So, yeah, keep that in mind. That, um, was it, uh, what's his name? Uh, um, Think and Grow Rich, Napoleon Hill, right? If you never read Think and Grow Rich, read that one because he talks a lot about sexual energy and transmuting that sexual energy into doing what you really want to do in life. So having a lot of sexual energy is a positive and you can use it in all kinds of ways. It doesn't have to control you. You can control it. I love that. That's an awesome point. Uh, have you looked into like plastics? And I used to be obsessed with uh, detox. Like my whole life was detoxification and I thought I was getting nutrition, but I was missing stuff. So I did the gua sha thing with the spoon in the sauna to scrape toxins out of my skin and, you know, nice. cotton plastics. But it seems like phthalates, I mean, it's a estrogen mimicker, right? Yes. That's, big... that, that's another one of these modern day alpha inhibitors. Once again, you know, bef plastics haven't been around that long, right? But now they're finding all of these problems with them. Um, you know, even... Like, for instance, we talked about water. You know, I even with the water, I recommend guys take it around in a glass jug. I use a two-quart milk glass jug that they deliver to your house, you know. Um, because even though you get a BPA-free container, they don't know yet if these other um, chemicals are causing, an, you know, an estrogen-mimicking problem or a... Um, you know, some sort of endocrine disrupting problem they don't know yet, then they might. There might be something worse than BPA. But what they do know is that even if that's not the case, when they create a plastic bottle, that plastic bottle leaches out chemical residue for up to a year after it's made. And you think about it, you know, they don't make these bottles and just let them sit on a shelf for a year and then fill them with stuff. They fill them with stuff right away. So no matter what it is you're consuming that is in a plastic container, it's having some sort of plastic chemical leaching into it. And if it's, a, if it's an oily substance or an acidic substance, it's going to be even worse. That's an awesome point. Yeah, when I went to uh, college, I would see... Um, just all the kids. I, I think I was the only one that I ever saw carrying a glass container around. And I had like a, a Carl Strauss growler. And one time the campus police, I was walking to my car and they, they stopped me and they're like, what do you got there? And I'm like, oh, it's spring water that I harvested myself. And they got freaked out. And I had like my affirmations all over it. And stuff. <laughs> I probably looked like a freak. <laughs> I love it, man. Uh, we're like birds of a feather. That's it's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was always in plastic and it would, just the sun beating down, you know, they'd be on the grass reading and they're just plastic drinking waters, just getting hammered by UV. And I'm just like, no wonder everyone's all messed up. <laughs> and it's true. It's true. And they buy cases of these things, right? Thinking that they're doing themselves a favor because they're 
drinking all this bottled water where, you know, you'd be much better off investing in some sort of good water filtration system at your home or, you know, even better yet, going and get, get yourself some spring water. Yeah, I'm a fan of the RO. I think that's a pretty basic thing for people. To, yeah, yeah. I tell I've people, got one go find a water thing. dispenser. Nice. That's right, um, yeah. It's worth the investment. They're, they're a pain in the butt to install, but they're worth it. <laughs> um, so let's let's tackle this one. Uh, sex diseases, like we had uh, STDs, um, sex during pandemic times, <laughs> uh, okay. HPV, herpes, all, all that sort of stuff. I've, I think there's solutions to these things. Like I, I have like a rife frequency machine here in my office, and I think frequency therapy can shatter pathogens. I've seen it, but I don't know. It's, I think people get freaked out. And there's medicinal mushrooms. There's a lot of stuff I think that we have access to now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I, you know, I don't know. I, I'm certainly open to that. But once again, like I said, I'm not a doctor. So when it comes to diseases, I'm not an expert at all. You know, in terms of giving you advice, I wouldn't feel real comfortable about that. But I would say, you know, COVID or no COVID, it's important to be careful out there if you're dating. You know, um, I always use condoms. So even if it wasn't a pregnancy kind of thing, I would uh, always protect myself in that sense. And I, I remember there was a question there since we're talking about that on what the best uh, uh, birth control was to use. You know, well, I'll just say in terms of condoms, what I recommend is the skin brand, S-K-Y-N. Okay, I really like that. To me, it feels the best and it's non-latex. So I don't know, kind of being like tuning into energy and stuff. I just feel like there's a much better energy transfer too with that particular condom. But I do use condoms um, because I do date. Is that lambskin? Is that what they use? That you know, I'd have to pull it out. I'm not 100% sure. I don't remember. I'd pull it out. It's funny. I, uh, <laughs> I, I don't have one here in front of me. I couldn't tell you. But I could say if you look it up, S-K-Y-N. And I've been meaning to actually look into this to see if, because, you know, latex is definitely an insulator. Like, you know, it's, it's a rubber insulator, so you can actually insulate electricity. So it, to me, it, it's like blocking that human energy that's happening, you know, that especially that really intimate human energy, which I want to try to minimize the blocking of that, but I want to stay safe. And to me, I don't seem to feel that blocking with the skin. I could be wrong. It could be all psychological, but... To me, it, I, it just seems more natural and feels more natural. No, it makes total sense. Yeah, I talk a lot about how we emit photons and we run on electricity and, um, you know, leathers conductive, uh, animal skins would be conductive. So that would make sense. Mm -hmm. um, yes. And that's it. It's a good segue. We can go into the philosophical questions here. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, do you believe in a chakra system impacting sexual expression? Uh, I don't know. I guess you could take that wherever you want, if that makes sense. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, it's a good question. Um, I, I do believe in a subtle energy system within the human body. Whether or not it actually follows those exact chakras, I don't know. It seems like, you know, I feel it that way. Um, I don't know for sure, but I do think that um, there that that energy system is there, and it's really important. And I'll say this: even if it's not, even if it's not there, if you can use um, like there's some techniques I use in my system where we actually feel that energy and move that sexual energy out. So even if it's not actually there. Being able to tune into your sexual energy and move it, being able to move it throughout your body, will do amazing things for your lasting power. Because that's a lot of what, you know, when you have premature ejaculation, is all of that energy gets built up right there in your genitals. So you, you know, you get really turned on and that's where it goes. But if you can take that and spread it out, it makes it much easier to last longer. And in fact, 
what I've what I do, and actually some of my students have been able to do, is start to have non ejaculatory multiple orgasms. So you can actually have an orgasm as a man without ejaculating. And the advantage of that is you can just keep going, right? So, because it's the ejaculation that causes the refractory period. And for some men, that refractory period can be really long, especially the older you get in what kind of health situation you're in. But if you, uh, if you learn how to move that energy and start feeling, plus it's way more pleasurable because you feel it throughout your entire body. So, yes, I do believe, I do think there's a chakra system. I do believe there's an energy system throughout the body um, that they've known about for thousands of years. We don't know that much about it and as much as we should. I think there's still a lot of mystery there. But like I said, even if it weren't the case, even if it's not there, even if you just use your imagination to feel it, it will do amazing things for your lasting power. It's awesome. Yeah, I've heard of like the upward draw. Is that kind of what you're talking about, like Montauk Chia stuff? Yeah, there's different ways to do it. I've done some stuff with Montauk Chia. That's, that stuff works well. Um, and in Tantra, there's ways of moving the energy up and then back down or, and to different chakra systems. Oops. Um, and then just moving them out. Like e even if you're not moving it up this, what they call the central channel, the spine, and through the chakras, you can move it through your extremities, which is an easier way, I think, to learn it initially, is to actually have it shoot through your trunk and your arms and your legs. And still, it keeps you, you can have multiple non-ejaculatory orgasms that way as well. Or you can, it, so there's different ways to experience this. Um, but there, the, the, I guess to answer your question, that's one particular technique. But there's whole different ways of doing it, and you don't even have to uh, get real anal or exact about the method. Just using your intention will move the energy. Right? That's really all you need to do. Just use your willpower and your intention. You can move energy all throughout your body. That's awesome. And I imagine the healthier physical body is the easier it is to do that <laughs> for sure yeah definitely and um the the better everything feels and once again coming back to libido that's another thing losing the weight you know in a healthy way so where there's not a lot of fat fat actually has a lot of um a lot of detrimental effects but particularly on the libido because one of the things that happens with body fat is it produces uh, what's called aromatase enzyme and aromatase will take free testosterone that's in your system and it will turn it into estrogen so you lose that free testosterone and that's part of one of the one of the major biochemicals when it comes to libido wow that's a good point yeah i talk a lot about um you know, vegetable oils and I'm not a yeah. fan of omega-3 supplements and these things that get stored in the body fat and cortisol will actually cause a release of free fatty acids from the adipose tissue. And if those are primarily unsaturated fats, then that has a cascading hormone, hormonal effect of raising estrogen and uh, suppressing the metabolism and all sorts of not so good stuff, lowering body temperature and pulse. So, uh, that's real interesting. Yeah, that's an excellent point, you know, because it's like stored there, like you're saying, and then all of a sudden it gets released, and you might not have even eaten something at that point. You're trying to figure out what's the problem. Well, the problem was there, and then it got released. And I'm with you, particularly with those vegetable oils or any kind of those seed oils. Those things are horrible for you, probably even worse than sugar. I mean, they're really bad. So that's I highly recommend you get away from any kind of vegetable oil or seed oil like soybean oil or canola oil or any of that stuff yeah it seems like an older generation thing like cooking with that like sunflower or olive oil even i use only like ghee or coconut oil so yeah 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 me too or or olive oil i'll use um, palm oil is okay but yeah those oils you know 
because I, you know, I'm older than you, you know, because I, gr- I grew up with that too, right? So when I was young, it, it was like margarine was the thing, right? It's like in vegetable oils, you know, it was get away from the animal products because that's what was giving you the heart attacks. But when you look at how these uh, vegetable oils are made and these seed oils are made, there is a ton of processing that goes on. And it's, uh, they got to bleach it. And then you end up ingesting all that stuff. And it's not something that's natural, like um, like a coconut oil or um, avocado oil or an an, even an animal oil. You can get that oil right out of it. There's so much oil in it. With those seed oils, they got to really process it to get that oil out. I mean, it looks nice and clear in your bottle, but that took a lot of processing to make it look like that. Yeah. I even have a camel hump fat here. It's kind of interesting. It has like a gamey <laughs> taste to it. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, have you worked with anyone with sexual trauma? Because that seems to be a root cause of low libido. And I had a couple people ask good resources or good healing modalities for sexual trauma. Or is there a way to move it out of the body? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And yes, I've worked with those people. And me, myself, you know, I've had some sexual trauma and shame and all that and I think most people have had some sort of sexual trauma or definitely sexual guilt or sexual shame and there's different things you could do I mean you could go to a therapist of course and you know that's that could be a really good idea to talk through it uh, then there's different things I use in in my uh, program but one of the things I find most helpful that's free that you can do is uh, tapping or emotional freedom technique, if you're familiar with that. Now, if you're not, there's different sources. You can just go to the tappingsolution.com because they have a lot of free stuff on there. But that stuff is really powerful. And when it comes, like you were talking about, you know, worried about the woo-woo stuff and stuff, I had kind of a, I didn't have a terrible problem with that. But this is a good example of letting something like that block you and take something too long because I knew about emotional freedom technique a long time ago and when I looked into it it did look too woo woo to me it's like well, this isn't going to do anything you know immediately dismissing it not even trying it right and that was a huge mistake because I've used that technique to get over all kinds of trauma not just sexual trauma in in just emotional turmoil anytime I'm going through something I consider it like a big gun and you always have it with you and uh, I've actually developed techniques that you can use it to where you don't even have to physically tap yourself and still make it work. But the nice thing about this is what got me back into it is I saw they did some studies on this. Harvard Medical School is using this, and they use these functional MRIs where they can actually see what's happening in the brain in real time. And what it does, what the tapping does, is it takes the amygdala, and the amygdala is one of the primary parts of the brain that form trauma events, you know, form that association. It's part of the fight or flight response. And it takes that and it turns it way down. It just tunes it way down. So the cool thing about tapping is it's like the opposite of, or at least you can be used this way. I think it's the best way to use it, the opposite of positive thinking. So instead of you saying, not that there's anything I want positive thinking, there is, but it's another tool. So instead of you saying positive affirmations, you're saying the things that are going through your mind that are causing you the trauma, right? So say we're, say it's a um, like performance anxiety, which you said as an example, because I use this for, for performance anxiety quite a bit, where, you know, going through your mind is like, damn, you know, man, I hope I get an erection. Last time I didn't get an erection. Shit, what's going to happen? What is she going to do if I don't, if I can't get hard? And you say those things as you're tapping through these points. And the great thing is, is it allows you to express these things like you're truly feeling, but it does it in a way that turns the amygdala down so it doesn't trigger the fight or flight response. So when you're in that situation and you start thinking these things, the chances of you having a problem go way down, right? And you can apply that with anything. It can be sexual trauma. 
you know, you can um, talk about what's going through your mind when you think about what happened um, or sexual shame. It can be anything that causes emotional problems. It doesn't have to be performance anxiety. It can be any kind of trauma, any kind of emotional thing. So I think it's a really good tool to have under your tool belt because it's free. The only thing I would say is it does look woo-woo, but the science is good. Look at the science behind it. The science is really good. And give it, th- I, what I always say is you got to try something at least three times, all right? So, so many times guys will come up to me, well, I tried that once. It's like, once? It's like, you know, it's like I picked up the guitar once. I can't play the guitar. It's like, well, what the hell kind of sense does that make? You got to try something multiple times, but do it at least three times and each time give it at least 15 minutes, okay? And if it still doesn't work for you, well, you know, maybe it's not for you. But I think if you do that, you'll see some really good results with tapping. That's awesome. Um, let's see. This is an interesting one. Can pre-ejaculatory fluid get a woman pregnant if no protection is used? Short answer is yes, unfortunately. But it's highly unlikely. But it could happen because they have shown um, that pre-cum can have uh, sperm in it right? Not a bunch, but it only takes one, right? <laughs> so there's a possibility. It's unlikely, but yes, it could happen. Awesome. Um, let's see. How can a man hold his erection for more than 15 minutes? He's in his low 30s. I guess a gal asked that about her partner. Uh, yeah, just general ways to last longer. Than... Yeah, well, that's a big topic. So Okay, this is what I would say, first of all, is there's a lot of things that can affect that. Okay, um, and let's take, I want to take this um, concept of venous leakage as an example, okay, because this is getting more well-known. For, for a long time, a lot of guys didn't know what venous leakage is. Now a lot of guys are starting to know, and they're self-diagnosing themselves with venous leakage when they don't have it. Venous leakage is really not that common. It does happen, but you got to get formally diagnosed to really know. And this is what they do. We talked about earlier about Trimix, where you have to inject your penis with this chemical, to, and it forces an erection. Well, when you, in order for them to determine if you have venous leakage, they have to do that. And the reason they have to do that is because if you just get a natural erection and lose it, it can be just simple performance anxiety. Okay, Performance anxiety is that powerful in losing your erection. And they have to take it out of the equation. Because if they don't, that's one of the potential problems. So they inject your penis, and then they do a Doppler to see if there are problems with the valves in your penile veins, which is what causes venous leakage. The reason I bring that story up is that there's two things right there, okay? We just talked about blood flow, blood with venous leakage. There's performance anxiety, okay, that could be causing it. There can be some problem with your dopamine system because of porn addiction or any kind of addiction that's causing a problem with your erections. Um, There can be uh, hormonal imbalances, Um, I mean, there's a whole variety of things that can be causing these erection problems. So really what I recommend is that you, uh, you take the Xander Holt assessment. It's a little bit of a a plug here, but it's a free tool that I made. And, uh, if you just go to rockhardfl.com backslash Z H A one, it will take you to this free assessment. And the reason I say that is because it will tell you what, your primary core alpha inhibitor is. And that, when you get that piece of information, that will tell you what's probably most of your problem when it comes to maintaining, getting or maintaining an erection. Because it's best to find out what it is. Because once again, when you ask a general question like that, it's it's a fair question. But it may not, it, it could be anything. Like you could, there's guys that will take ED drugs which will definitely affect the blood flow. It will improve the blood flow into your penis and nothing happens because it's not a blood flow issue with them. It's some other issue 
that's going on. And sometimes it can be multiple issues, right? But the best thing to do is to find out what your primary issue is and start focusing on that. Because, you know, if you can get that under control, then more than likely your erections are going to get harder and last longer. And that's part of what I do. I mean, it's, there's no reason it's unnatural for you not to be getting rock hard erections that are long lasting. That's unnatural. Okay. Even as you age it, you know, it, it's, it's reasonable for it to decrease somewhat, but not like it is today. Okay. Where I have like even 17, 18, 19 year olds contacting me on a regular basis saying they can't get an erection or they can't maintain an erection. Okay. We're in a real modern day crisis when it comes to, um, well, a whole bunch of things, but certainly with uh, sexuality and male sexuality in particular, because it's more, it's more pronounced with women too, but it's more pronounced in men because you can, you know, if there's no erection, there's no intercourse happening, right? It's visible. You can see it, right? It, with women, it tends to be that you, you tend to mo- notice it more in terms of decreased sex drive or vaginal dryness, that type of thing. That's a great point. Wow. Yeah. And I, I'm a big fan. Like I sell systemic enzymes, like natokinase and serpeptase. And yes. I know that the scar tissue in the penis can inhibit blood flow. So there's, there's like, like you said, there's so many factors that can, it's probably a little bit of all of them. <laughs> That's right. That's right. It could be scar tissue, um, plaque. It could be fascial restrictions, hormonal imbalance. I mean, all kinds of different things. So it's, it's, a, I used to have to get on a call and talk with people to get, you know, get, but I can't do that. That's why I designed that particular assessment. It's not perfect, but it will definitely get you in the ballpark. That's awesome. Yeah. I'll put a link, uh, under in the show notes for that. Okay, Um, great. I'm in the same track here. Uh, is it possible to increase the flaccid length of the penis? Uh, someone wants more girth (laughs) and increase the size. Uh, yeah. And what age does the penis stop developing? That's a question. <laughs> <laughs> it is an interesting question. Um, well, let me take the, the first ones there. So, yes, it is definitely possible to increase uh, penile length, including fa- flaccid length, um, unless you've already, you're already maxed out. Okay. Uh, most guys aren't. Half of the penis is buried inside of the body. Okay, it's the buried shaft. And you can actually work it to where you can extend that out, okay? It takes time, and it takes persistence, okay? You can increase the size of your penis. That's not a big thing with me. I've done some of that. In fact, there is, um, so the two things, well, three things, really. There's um, what they call jelking, okay, which is, it's a form of, there's some of the jelking I like, some of it I don't like. You've got to be careful with that. You can really damage yourself. Always be err on the side of caution when it comes to this stuff, okay? Because we're talking about stretching and pulling and that type of stuff. And some guys will do hanging. They'll actually put hangers on and uh, put a weight and hang their penis down. That can at least increase length, not necessarily growth on that one, but... It's got to be done for long periods of time, and it can cause damage. Just just like when you go into the gym, you're causing some damage to improve yourself because you'll do some muscle damage. The body will come in and repair it, and it will, if you did it correctly, it will typically make you stronger and give you some muscle hypertrophy. It'll make it a little bit bigger. But if you get in there and you do it incorrectly and you go crazy, you can damage joints, ligaments, And you can make it take months to recover. I've had guys contact me who have um, done various forms of penis enlargement, like jelking or pumping, which we'll talk about in a second. But way overdoing it, ending up with penile numbness, um, at least temporary incontinence, you know. Um, these are all things that can happen. You can damage yourself. Okay. So with any of this stuff, be careful, especially when we're talking about penile enlargement, because guys get crazy with penile enlargement. I mean, think about why are you doing it in the first place? Okay. Why are you doing it? I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. Okay. But most guys are doing it because they're insecure 
about their penis size. And let's keep this in perspective. The average penis length is not even five and a half inches, okay? It's somewhere about 5.2 inches, okay? That's the average erect penis length, okay? Um, and when we're talking seven inches, we're only talking about 15% of the population, okay, at seven. And when you start going beyond seven, like seven to eight, that's way down there. That's like maybe 2% of the population. I have to look at the statistics, but it's way down there. And this, this once again, ties in a lot to porn because this gets into guys' heads from porn where most of the guys in there are sporting from 8 to 10 inches. That's the standard, right? So you're seeing guys in there that are in the top 2% when it comes to penis size. So you comparing yourself to them, horrible idea. It's like women getting, you know, bodies a dysmorph dysmorphic disorder from just looking at fashion magazines and stuff where they're airbrushing models and all kinds of stuff. Same thing can happen to us with this penis size stuff. In most women from surveys will say that the average penis size is what they prefer to maybe slightly or at more than average. But we're not talking about big monster dicks okay that's not what we're talking about some women do and some women actually prefer smaller right they're on the outliers right you're gonna have a bell curve no matter what you're talking about but most of the women are going to be right around they want average anyway and i can tell you right now what they're more interested in is your hardness than your size okay and that's what i deal with primarily hardness is way more important to them because that tells them, particularly if you're doing it naturally without ED drugs, it's telling them that they're turning you on, okay? And that's a huge turn on for them, okay? Way more than the size of your penis, okay? So if you're going to get obsessed about something, get obsessed more about the hardness than the size. But since we're talking about size, okay, so that's the jelking. Pumping has been shown to do it. Um, once again, it takes a lot of time, and you got to be really consistent with it and not overdo it. You can definitely damage your penis with a pump and also uh, what they call shockwave therapy or low-intensity uh, or acoustic wave therapy where it will um, uh, build new blood vessels, break up microplaque, and get a lot more blood flow in there. But typically, you'll do that in conjunction with a penis pump, and that's what I did. Uh, with a, a product called the Phoenix. I reviewed that product, and as I did 12 treatments, I did see uh, an, an um, increase in my size, both girth and length. And I, I put that in my review video if you want to see that. Um, and it's difficult, since you have that question too, it's difficult to increase one without increasing the other. So it's difficult to increase girth without increasing length. Um, it's easier to increase length without increasing girth by doing the hanging, if you want. But increasing girth without length, there's ways to do it, but it's not easy. I mean, it's, and it's not foolproof. You're going to increase length, too, to a certain degree. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Um, what's, what's jelking? Is it J-E-L? -K? Yeah, it's J-E-L-Q, I believe, jelking. Okay. I don't think there's – there may be a U in there, Q-U-I-N-G never heard of that <laughs> joking yeah yeah it's just a it's a it's a series of uh, it's just a series of techniques um that they're manual techniques you do on the penis so it's basically stretching now i am a fan of the stretching right um and to get back to the i'm sorry the flaccid length the stretching and the pump will help the most with that Okay, the stretching and the pump. But if you do that, so you'll do stretching, there's what's called milking, which is kind of a, a light sort of massage. And I'm kind of a fan of the milking. The milking can be really helpful, not just for size, but for increasing the hardness of your erection. And that's basically where you're just kind of going up the penis with, a, with your hand, okay, up and down, just milking it, just keeping a constant blood flow going through. Um, and then there's various types of massage and uh, pulling and stuff. It's just that when you do the pulling and that stuff, you got to be careful. Be careful with joking. Some of it's good. Some of it's not so good. But always keep in mind, that's your junk. You know, you're going to mess it up, and then you're not going to be happy. No one's going to be happy, right? You don't you're get better to err on the side of caution, <laughs> all right? Okay. 
<laughs> right. Do you think Kegel exercises are foundational? Because I think those are pretty popular. Yeah, Kegel exercises are really good. Um, there's different types of Kegel exercises. I think some are better than others. You can definitely overdo Kegels. There's kind of a sweet spot there. But Kegels are, are really good both in helping you to... Um, helping with the hardness of your erection, but also in terms of helping you last longer. Kegels can help a lot with that. Both Kegels and what's called reverse Kegels, they're both really helpful with that um, in learning how to get good at it. Um, with me and the techniques I use, I use more instead of these sort of really hard holds and you know it where it goes from zero to nothing learning how to have fine control over those muscles because that's where it gets really helpful in terms of lasting as long as you want because when you ejaculate when you get to the point of no return one of the first things that happen are those muscles start to tense Right. And if you're able to control them, particularly at a fine granular level, and you keep them relaxed, it becomes more and more difficult for your body to trigger ejaculation. So for me, it's not just a question of getting them strong. It's a question of getting good control of them. This mind, you, the connection between your brain and those muscles. Okay, getting really good at being able to control them because that will make you much more of a master in the bedroom when you're able to do that than just having brute strength. Um, and because the other problem with the brute strength is because some guys will actually even put weights on their, their penis and really try to get it as strong as possible. And they'll do these really long holds. But the problem with that is it creates a lot of tension down there even when you're done. So you get this muscle tone that stays in there. And the problem with that is in order to get an erection, those muscles have to relax to allow blood flow to get in. So those guys can start having problems getting that erection in the first place. Not necessarily maintaining it once they get it, but they start having a hard, a difficult time getting hard. So, yeah, they're good, but just like anything, you can overdo it. Awesome. Um, powerful aphrodisiacs. I saw you had a video on uh, oysters. <laughs> yeah, oysters are really good. You know, that was one of, uh, uh, what was it, Casanova's big thing and uh, Genghis Kong, you know, was uh, oysters. But the cool thing about oysters, and that, a lot of, there's, I'd say a lot of guys, but there, there's a number of guys who don't like oysters. You don't have to have oysters, okay, even though I talk about oysters. But the reason I talk about oysters is because they're just jam-packed with a lot of the stuff that will help your sexual performance. And for women, too. I don't know the names of these amino acids off the time of, of my head, but there's a couple of amino acids that are in oysters, that are very rare. They're very hard to find. You can't just buy a supplement of them off the, the shelf. And uh, they've been shown to really help with libido and sex drive. So they're very good for your sex drive. And uh, oysters are full of zinc, you know, and zinc is really important for male performance. And when I was talking about earlier, you got to be careful about supplementing with zinc. You know, when it comes with natural zinc, when it's from food, you don't have to worry about it like that. You can have plenty of that. And those kind of things will help a lot, too, with your refractory period. Because when you ejaculate, you lose a lot of zinc. And uh, having, you know, a fair amount of zinc in your system can really help you recover a, a lot quicker. Um, so, yeah, oysters are really good with, for uh, libido. That's awesome. That's a good transition. We had like 10 questions or so on uh, uh, semen retention, no fap. You know, I had a guy ask, uh, he only releases every three months. Is that okay? Uh, I know I have a friend that went like a year. I, it, it's really trending right now. Um, Adam Bergstrom that I have on my show, he's not a fan. He thinks that kind of like use it or lose it kind of thing. Uh-huh. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a no that's that's a good point and it's a very good question and i wish i could give you a hard and fast answer on that i'm going to give you my opinion on it but i have researched that too because there are 
advantages to both, okay? Because they have shown that um, guys who do ejaculate more tend to have lower rates of prostate cancer. And there is something to use it or lose it. But there's also something to semen retention because when you retain semen, you build up a lot of sexual energy. And that sexual energy can really help you in the bedroom, particularly when you get good at lasting as long as you want. Then you got the best of both worlds. You've got all the sexual energy is just keeping you going, and then you could just go as long as you want. So I kind of com- combine the two a little bit personally. But I don't know hard, and I haven't seen any hard and fast science on this. But like I said, I'm going to give you my opinions. My personal opinion is that you should ejaculate at least once a month. Okay, I don't think you should go more than once a month. I think three months is too long, unless you're doing something like no fap and it's a very temporary kind of thing. You know, that's a different thing. You're getting off a porn addiction. That may be okay. In three months, maybe okay. Once again, this is my opinion. But I do think there's something to that use it or lose it. And if you're never, if you're taking so long to ejaculate, your body really starts to deprioritize that, right? And then it may start working a little bit differently and you may not be getting the same kind of libido and sexual energy that you used to, particularly after you ejaculate, you may notice an even bigger crash. I don't know for sure. But um, I think a year is way too long. I, I, w- I personally wouldn't recommend that. Like, like for me, it's not based on science. It's just based on what I've read and my own personal th- thoughts on this is that you should ejaculate at least once a month. I ejaculate once or twice a week. Okay, that's my personal thing. And I, I almost, almost always do it with a partner. And I don't always ejaculate with a partner, just to be completely honest, because sometimes I want to retain that. But, um, yeah, that's what I do. So, and I don't, I don't have any problems with that. But part, part of what this always, let's come back to that pre-cum we talked about earlier. What I think is, because that pre-cum in what's coming out there, part of this ejaculatory fluid that's coming out is coming from the prostate, okay? And when that comes out, see, I think part of what's happening when the prostate cancer risks are going down with the ejaculation is that that seminal fluid that's in there needs to get worked. It needs to get turned and worked. And when you're having pre-cum, okay, that does help bring some of that out of your prostate. So what, uh, you know, my, my thoughts on this are since I can last as long as I want, and I teach guys how to do that, you're constantly going to a point to where you're getting to that point of no return, but you're not going over it. So there's a lot, just like even before you even start sex, there can be a lot of pre-cum that comes out if you get really excited, really aroused. Well, the same thing's happening, you know, when you're having sex. You, as long as you're getting close to orgasm or you're having these non-ejaculatory orgasms, you're having that pre-cum come out. It's coming out. So that is helping to move that um, fluid in the prostate, okay? Once again, there's no studies on this. Um, I haven't seen any any study that's looked at guys who ejaculate all the time versus guys who, you know, <laughs> can last as long as they want and get lots of pre-cum coming out. Is there a difference in prostate cancer risk? I don't know if you'll ever see that. But th- th- there has been studies on, you know, ejaculation and prostate cancer risk going down. So anyway, those are my opinions. Okay. That's fascinating. Yeah, I just I just finished a book. Um, I've been diving into this thing called biorhythms. It was like discovered in the 19th century. Yeah. yeah. And my dad used to be big a, into those. No way. Yeah. I've been kind of just practicing to see how accurate they are. Like, And uh, yeah, it's the idea that we have like a 23-day physical cycle, 28-day emotional cycle, and 33-day intellectual cycle and these waves – and the, the book I read is saying like a lot of famous people that died, they were at the lowest of their, like the, the lowest of their physical cycle or when they had surgery. So I wonder if, 
it, you know, if working your sexuality around that, like maybe when you're at lowest physical cycle as a man, not ejaculating or something. I don't know. It's just an idea. I don't know. It's possible. You know, I don't know, but you know, the cycles are everywhere, right? So and cycles do affect us all the time. You know, like, uh, for instance, we talked about sleep before, you know, your sleep improves significantly if you stay in the circadian rhythm with the earth. So for instance, if you're basically getting up with sunrise and, you know, particularly if you get that sun on you and in your eyes and, you know, you get in tune with that right a bit, right away and you basically go to bed close to when the sun goes down. You basically stay in rhythm with that uh, versus, you know, going to bed at maybe two o'clock in the morning and still getting eight hours of sleep. You're, you're going to get better sleep and more restful sleep if you stay in rhythm with the earth. So, yeah, cycles are a very real thing that are all around us. I mean, you can just, you know, just look at women, right? You, it's very obvious with women. They're every month they're going through a cycle. So they're everywhere. Cycles are everywhere. And the more you can be in tune with those cycles, I think the better we function. I agree. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, let's see. We haven't talked about women too much, so maybe we'll have to have another episode. But <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. I'm questions. primarily a men's <laughs> sex health expert, but, you know, we can talk about that too. Uh. A woman says she had sex for the first time in six years and the man kept falling out. Does that mean I'm loose? Well, no, not necessarily. I mean, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. It might be his size, uh, might be a lubrication issue. I don't know. But what I can say is that, you know, if you want to work on that, you can work on those Kegels, right? Work on your Kegel exercises and you can buy these eggs, um, that they sell for women or balls, you know, that you can put inside of you that work, that you can actually work against this stuff to uh, help build those muscles up. And that will help quite a bit with your, um, you know, overall tightness and you know, as well as your enjoyment. You know, those, the, the better toned your PC muscles are and the better control you have over them, the more intense your orgasms tend to be. So, you know, it's, it's good all around. That's awesome. And then women's orgasm, like, uh, why can't some women have orgasms? How can a woman reach an orgasm? And what would be the reason for a female ever being able to climax? Kind of like different angles, I guess, at that. Right. And um, that's it. Okay. So, you know, we talked about the physical aspects, first of all, before, you know, the gut and all that stuff. I would make sure all that's in place. Right. So because you always want to make sure you've got the the building blocks in place. But when it comes to orgasms, particularly with women, this is not as um, apparent in men um, because. Well, let, let me put it this way. So sex primarily, even for men, is primarily in the mind. It's not primarily in the body. And this is more evident in women. And that's part of the reason why you'll see them more into like romance novels and verbal stuff, right, than, than visual, right? It's more in the mind. So that's something for you guys to really get in mind is you need to engage your woman's mind. This is really important. And let's talk about that because we talked about it before about cortisol being brought down differently in men and women through testosterone with men, oxytocin with women. Well, some other differences are in there too, and there's brain differences they can see in terms of the connections. Like with women, the connections between the left and right hemisphere are more pronounced. There's better connections, deeper connections that go through the corpus callosum. So women are much more global in their thinking, and they're much more multitasking in their thinking. So their mind can be all over the place which makes it more difficult for them to relax. And when it comes to orgasms, relaxation is critical, particularly for men, for women. The, the three things that are most important uh, in the bedroom in general, particularly when we're talking about orgasms, are relaxation, arousal, and immersion. And as a guy, you can really help your woman out a lot by guiding her through this. We talked about in the beginning where I was talking about how I was getting much more expressive vocally, 
right, and how it opened me up. But it also gave her an amazing experience. And part of that is, is because my expression of pleasure kept her focused in the moment. You know, that focus is very important uh, for both men and women, but particularly for women, because like I said, their mind can be all over the place. So if you, you want to keep them in that moment. So it becomes even more powerful if you start using stuff like dirty talk, right? And really talking to them, even if just keeping it basic, just talking about what you're doing to them or what you're going to do to them as you're doing it, just keeping them focused in that moment will do amazing things in terms of have, getting them to orgasm if they're having a hard time orgasm they got to be relaxed so if you if they're not relaxed you need to work on that you need to get them relaxed it's not nothing's going to happen if they're relaxed but part of what keeps them relaxed is they're not thinking about all this stuff you're keeping them focused and immersed right it's relaxation arousal and immersion and part of why dirty talk works so well is it really works on all three of those things. Because by you focusing her mind, almost like a hypnotist, in what you're saying, it keeps her mind focused, which helps her relax. What you're saying is turning her on, which gets her aroused, and it keeps her immersed in the situation. She's not thinking about other things. She's in the moment, just like you need to be in the moment. Because if you're in the moment, really enjoying it, you're going to you're going to keep her in the moment and she's going to you're both going to enjoy it so much and relax so much more. So when it comes to orgasms that those are really important and I would also say don't focus on orgasms. Okay, that's part of the problem. That's a lot of the problem with performance anxiety. Those two are kind of related. A woman having a problem with getting orgasms and a man having performance anxiety. Very similar. In that, um, God, what was my point there? Hold on. Uh, <laughs> I had a point I wanted to make. Could women use, ta maybe women could use. Yeah, you know, you absolutely. Well. <laughs> you can use it. You don't want to necessarily do it right there in the moment. But if you're having an issue with relaxation or with orgasms, see, part of the problem is, you see, I was seeing this woman one time where I was try I was helping her with that. And like, you know, we'd be having sex and I could hear her saying, relax, I need to relax, relax. That's not the way to do it, okay? So that was my point, is that you you got to focus on what you want, not on what you don't want. It, it's, a lot of times it's you're focusing, it's what you focus on that makes the difference. Okay, so for instance, with orgasms, don't focus on getting the orgasm because it runs away. It chases you. It's like you're chasing an animal, right? It's going to run away. You've got to coax it to you, right? That's It's different by food or what it wants, right? You coax the animal. A much easier way to catch the animal rather than chasing it all over the place and it running away from you. Instead, you want to focus on pleasure. Focus on giving her lots of pleasure, feeling pleasure, relax, relaxing and just feeling the pleasure. Okay, getting immersed in the pleasure. And the more you're able to relax, the more aroused you get, the more pleasure you experience, the more and more likely it is you're going to have an orgasm because that's the end result. The more and more you get, it builds up, and that ends into a climax, which is the orgasm. But if you're just focused on the orgasm, you're missing all the stuff that leads up to it, right? So I, I always recommend you don't... In fact, I call it the last cha chance mindset. And I give this advice to men all the time, but it goes for women too, and this will help with your orgasms. So whenever you go into the bedroom, I always go and I always recommend that you go into the bedroom with the mindset that this may be the very last time you ever get to have sex. Okay, Because first of all, that's the truth. Okay, we are not guaranteed any moment. We can go at any time. So this could be true for any experience, right? But it's particularly powerful when you go in for sex. Because when you go in with that mindset, which is the truth, and remember, the truth will set you free. Go in with the truth. You're a mortal being. This may be the last time you ever get to have sex. Then you're going to go and enjoy that experience. You're going to focus on enjoying the experience 
not on, oh shit, am I going to get an erection or damn, am I going to have an orgasm this time? No, this is it. (laughs) This is it. So whatever you get to enjoy this experience is what you're going to do. So you're going to really start going for what you really want. You're going to relax more and you're going to really savor the experience and give it the intention and respect that it deserves. And that's going to make it much more likely that you're going to get hard, stay hard, and experience orgasms. That was awesome. That's really cool. And maybe think about porn, like uh, the goal is kind of to ejaculate or orgasm, right? So that's porn's probably training people to to race, right? (laughs) It it really is. Race to the finish line. It really is, you know, and the um, the way we learned orgasm, uh, masturbation as a kid, you know, it was always, we got to do it in secrecy and sometimes we want to get it done quickly so we don't get caught and that kind of stuff. So that just sets us up for premature ejaculation. It makes it worse. I mean, there's some evolutionary aspects that come into play here too because, you know, those who can ejaculate quickly are going to reproduce more. And so you got that to deal with. But a lot of it has to do with these bad masturbation habits. I am not a, I am not down on masturbation at all. In fact, I think masturbation could be really powerful and could teach you, help you learn how to last as long as you want if you do it correctly. I call it power masturbation. But most masturbation is going to make things a lot worse. And you're right. That's exactly what porn is designed to do. It's designed to, uh, you know, get you to ejaculate quickly and just to focus on the mechanics of it. I mean, a lot of times, especially nowadays, if there is any kind of intro where they both have their clothes on, the next thing you know, they're having sex. It just like immediately goes right to that saying there's no foreplay, you know, and, and to me, the magic is in the foreplay. Because that's where the arousal builds up, especially if you want your woman having orgasms. But you too, a lot of guys just completely underestimate how pleasurable foreplay can be. To me, the whole thing is sex. I see the whole thing is sex. I'd, why rush to an ejaculation? Yeah, it's great. The orgasm's great, but the whole thing is pleasurable. Right? Take your time, man. Really enjoy it. And porn just like sweeps all that aside. Yeah, well said, and and uh, it sounds like you've studied the the artificial light, and you've looked at all the other aspects. Like, it seems like there's a lot of damaging effects. There's probably a lot of men, especially watching porn, you know, at midnight or one a.m. and they're screwing up their circadian rhythm at the same time. They're messing with their dopamine. <laughs> oh, for sure. Yeah, that's like a double whammy, right? So they've got their dopamine system that's been screwed up, um, and then the blue light from the 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 Uh, monitor that's coming through and the fact that you're out of um, rhythm with the the earth I mean you don't have to do everything perfectly but you're right we come down to light again so we talk about light on the testicles how powerful that is well it's also can screw you up if you get the wrong kind of light at the wrong time of day you know if it wasn't for electricity we wouldn't have that that's another modern day alpha inhibitor right is that you know, when it was just gas lanterns and that kind of stuff, that kind of light that comes off a fire doesn't produce that kind of problem, doesn't have that kind of blue light that um, that we get from all these devices now. That's awesome. Well, I think we covered quite a bit. It got through a good amount of questions. And uh, yeah, I'd highly recommend people check out uh, your YouTube channel. I think all the videos are awesome and your website. I'll put the link to the uh, the assessment and then to get your your ebook as well. Um, thanks for coming on. That was a lot of fun. Oh, I had a blast, man. Anytime, anytime. I, I love talking with you, man. This is great. We we're on the same wavelength on so many things, and you know, I I love this kind of stuff. And yeah, yeah. F- feel free to come. I, in particular, I recommend that Xander Holt assessment because that will help you the most. But yeah, check out the YouTube channels. I got I got ton of stuff here that. Uh, can help you and your girl i love it um and you have a facebook group i think like a private yes we do uh, absolutely group. yeah it's uh if you go to rockhardfl.com backslash facebook it'll take you there same thing rockhardfl.com backslash youtube will take us to our youtube channel 
Awesome. Cool, Xander. We'll uh, stick around as I close out the show. Thanks so much. You bet. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much. That was a really fun interview. Xander is so fun to talk to, and I love that he's anti-porn. So I know that some people still think that that's okay. To me, there's those two sides that make it damaging. The ethical part of is it even consensual with the people involved? And the second aspect of why it's harmful to me is because it damages the brain, especially the dopamine receptors. Like I said in the show, the real thing is better. And I think a lot about the future, and I really think that the sex robots, the transhumanist kind of direction that humanity is going, the virtual reality, VR, porn, it's just going to get weirder and weirder. And so if we can actually connect as human beings and maybe surmount our guilt and shame about our sexuality and just be honest about our human needs, having a human body. I always mention the three H's, happy, hungry, and horny. How these are three markers of health, no lab test required. And most people only have one of those three going on, if any. I know a lot of men that have left veganism because of how it harmed their performance and actually destroyed their relationships. I've seen that time and time again, a lack of animal protein wrecks a man's ability to perform in the bedroom. And people will fight me over that all day long. But in the end, experience speaks louder than studies or whatever people want to say. And I've heard it enough times to know that it's true, that a male needs animal foods to perform. And it's not just for fun. It's to make a relationship functional, because if that part is not functional on a man, the relationship will not be functional. It's called balance. And I believe that a balanced nutritional approach that doesn't restrict macronutrients, that has carbohydrates, animal protein, saturated fat, and you're not afraid of honey and maple syrup, and if even white sugar works for you, you can add that in as well. I know Xander has a different view of that, but we all have a different piece of the puzzle, and that's how I see it. I really like how Xander highlights the modern-day alpha inhibitors, like high-speed internet porn. There's also EMFs, as he mentioned, preservatives. There's so many things that are getting in the way of a man actually being a man. And to me, that's part of the problem that we're in right now is that men are being suppressed hormonally in very aggressive ways with artificial wavelength blue light, with harmful non-native electromagnetic fields, with iron-fortified foods, omega-3s, on and on. There's so many things that suppress testosterone, cortisol, counters testosterone so what do you think if you're on a carb-free sugar-free deal and you have chronically elevated cortisol because you're not giving your body the primary fuel which is glucose then you will have chronically suppressed testosterone and again the proof's in the pudding when men add animal protein and carbohydrates that is the combination to get hard and stay hard if going to get graphic. And even nighttime erections. I mean, if there isn't an example of humans being sexual beings by nature, the morning wood situation, you can't think your way out of that one. You can't stop that from happening. And a lot of men, unfortunately, don't have that effect. It's actually supposed to happen during REM sleep, rapid eye movement. It's my understanding that REM sleep, that type of sleep, cannot happen if a man does not get an erection. 
So is it something to be ashamed of, to be guilty of, to shame others of? I personally don't think so. And there's a lot of ethics that go into this whole topic, and that's not the focus of this show. This was more to highlight the physical aspects of sex, especially as a man, which again carries over into a relationship because I get a lot of guys having issues and there's so many causes. And to me, a lot of the causes are calcification, lipofuscin, fibrosis, the usual suspects, but it might even be supplements that they're taking that are causing problems. That's why I talk a lot about safe supplements and cutting out certain supplements. I'm not a fan of zinc supplements, omega-3s, ascorbic acid, iron, iodine, a lot of different supplements that I've taken over the years, ascorbic acid. You always want to go to real food sources, whether that's desiccated oyster, desiccated beef liver, which is often overlooked. I just created what's called the grow a pair protocol on my Mito Life Academy. And I highlighted different products that I use like pine pollen tincture from Crucial 4. Some type of an aromatase inhibitor, vitamin E, could be Mito Life Pufa Protect. Mixed to cough roll, vitamin E acts like an aromatase inhibitor. I love the product by Vigor, Elk Antler Velvet. I average four of those a day, four capsules, which is 1,600 milligrams. Pretty substantial dose. And if I have more going on that day, more physically demanding day, then I'll actually take more. Even just working around the house, it doesn't have to be sexuality with this stuff. You know, these male supplements don't just have to be for sex. If you have to get stuff done on the farm, if you have a really active day where it's demanding a lot from you, I will actually take more of these things. And you could do the pine pollen powder as well. I did a video on snorting pine pollen powder, which is a source of phytoandrogens. And in nature, we would actually ingest it nasally. We would breathe in pine pollen. You could eat it as well. It's just questionable how absorbable those nutrients are. But I think these basic things, I think Shilajit also known as Indian Viagra. I have a Panacea product. A lot of people don't know that. I've got countless, almost daily messages of, Matt, this brought my libido back. Matt, this transformed my relationship. Matt, I had zero sex drive. And just two or three tablets of your Sheila G today brought back my libido. Full force. That's pretty cool. You might think minerals have a role to play in the libido, but it's not the ones they tell you about. It's copper. It's lowering the excess iron. It's getting into balance with your minerals. And I think organ meats is a great way to do it. I personally focus on beef liver largely, but I'll also take, take the pancreas and the gallbladder and different Organs, and if you weren't raised on them, the capsules still work. The desiccated products still work. My favorite one is from Saturi because it's actually freeze dried and it tastes better and it smells better than all of the other brands that I've tried. And I think lowering your stress too, whether that's with magnesium bicarbonate, collagen, gelatin, Icelandic flake salt. A lot of people are chloride deficient. Chloride requirements go up under stress. There's a lot of things you could stack. You could really just keep adding things in. I try to simplify it and you know, highlight the main things that could help. But check out the Mito Life Academy Grow Pair protocol and even before you do that, check out Xander's Rock Hard for Life. I'll put the link below where you can check out his work and take his assessment, like he mentioned. And don't neglect this area because 
it's a part of being human. And I think when we neglect this area of our life, it might take months, it might take years, it might take decades. But eventually, if we just ignore this part of being human, it will catch up to us and it will stress us out and it will affect every other area of our life. So rockhardforlife.com, uh, I'll put the link to his assessment below. He has a Facebook, his YouTube channel, I'll put the link to that as well. Or you can find it by searching Xander Holt. And I think he's doing great things. I think he's sharing really important information. There's not a lot of people talking about this. It's just one of those taboo subjects. And especially from a biohacking perspective, that's what I really like about Xander's, that he's integrating multiple different modalities and tools, including acoustic shockwave therapy, which I actually first heard about through Ben Greenfield. That's a really innovative way to increase functionality. I think fibrosis is really overlooked because scar tissue, fibrosis will inhibit blood flow. It will inhibit oxygen getting to the tissue. And that's a problem when we're talking about the penis. And oxidative stress is everywhere. You know, calcification, lipofuscin, they accumulate everywhere. And the issue for a man with getting an erection or whatever issue he's having, it might just be excess scar tissue. And you don't have to take bottles and bottles and bottles of systemic enzymes. Try one a day, three a day. Play around with the dosages. I personally take six capsules of dissolve it all on an empty stomach every morning. That's natokinase and seropeptase. And they circulate the body like Pac-Man eating up scar tissue everywhere. And so it's increasing blood flow everywhere. So you have a systemic benefit. I think a lot of people forget that mitochondrial function is foundational for health and that the mitochondria requires nutrients to function. And the one that's often overlooked, in addition to magnesium, that controls at least three of the complexes in the mitochondria, is vitamin K, and vitamin K2 especially. And you can get it from aged cheeses, or you can supplement it. But I find that most people underdose it, and they're not taking metaquinone 7, which is the MK7 form, which has numerous mitochondrial benefits to just help that whole process going electron transport chain and the proper generation of ATP of energy. But if I just had to pick one product from the MitoLife line, it would be Panacea. That is an amazing balancer as far as sexuality goes, both male and female. And there are studies that show that it increases free testosterone. And don't freak out women saying, oh, am I going to grow a mustache and facial hair? No, women need testosterone too, and it's in balance. And if you have mineral balance, you have hormonal balance. And of course, there's vitamin E, which helps counter estrogen, and that's a balancer as well. But the foundation of balance should be in the mineral kingdom. And I've been taking Shilajit for years you don't have to take five a day like me, even just two to three tablets a day. Most of the research I've read is 500 milligrams a day for 90 days, three months. So that'd be the equivalent of two and a half tablets. So you could just take three tablets of Panacea. And after three months, that is where you have the testosterone benefit there. So thank you so much for listening. You can go to MitoLife. Dot co if you want to support my work and purchase the MitoLife products. And matt-blackburn.com is where you can check out that elk antler velvet. You have to click products at the top or shop and then go all the way to the end. It's under V for Vigor, V-I-G-R, elk velvet antler. Love that product. I love the M-Power from Crucial 4. That's the pine pollen tincture. That's super powerful. And just start to integrate these things, the panacea, and make your own stack. And of course, don't forget the foundation, which is 
animal nutrition. And I feel like it's not enough to say real food because you have to specify because chicken every day is real food. But is that a healthy amount of PUFA to be intaking all the time? I don't think so. So limit the PUFAs as much as you can without being neurotic about it. Focus on saturated fats. Don't restrict carbohydrates or sugar. Make sure you're getting adequate protein and have fun with the journey. Today's quote is from Adam Bergstrom's sex newsletter number five, sexual spending. Culture is usually constructed on control, especially the control of sexual energy. A despotic and authoritarian government can't survive without sexual repression. Minding the brain is okay, but not the heart, and definitely not the genitalia. Letting go is verboten. Relaxing is discouraged. Anxiety is encouraged. Anxiety is the antithesis of sexual excitation. Sexual excitation arouses feelings and sensations of pleasurable expansion. Anxiety creates unpleasurable contraction. Wilhelm Reich was one of the first therapists to grok this polarity.